So welcome to our course. Please, please finally sit down somewhere. <clears throat> welcome to the course on Bhagavad Gita in essence. Now the purpose of this course is to um, not really give in a few days an overview of the whole Bhagavad Gita, but rather we want to look at uh, a few verses which have been identified by our Acharyas as being essential verses to the understanding of the whole Gita. <coughs> and uh, here I've listed them on the board and I'll explain what these verses are and what their significance is now in short and hopefully in these few days we can actually <laughs> go over them. I, I'm not, I must confess I'm not so sure how successful this course is going to be because unlike everybody else who been Jan Maharaj has given Nectar Devotion course so many times he could now give it in his sleep but <laughs> But this is something I've just put together and uh, we're only allotted one hour and we only have six actual days of lessons. And like a madman I made huge uh, piles of information which probably I won't be able to <laughs> to either transmit and you won't be able to absorb. So we'll just play it by ear. So anyway, these are the verses of these these names for them have been given by Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and Srila Baladev Vidya Bhusan in their Gita commentaries this last one 1155 <coughs> if there is a a Sanskrit name for it I don't know it but I know Prabhupada in the purport says, this, says that this is the essence of the Bhagavad Gita now I want to make a cautionary note that just because I put up these verses here that does not mean that these are the only essential verses of the Gita. As I've been talking with Donadar Maharaj, there are many others. Uh, Srila Prabhupada once said the verse Janma Karma Chamedi Vyam Evam Yovetita. This is the most important verse in the whole Bhagavad Gita. And there are many other verses that could be considered essential. But I've chosen these simply because I happen to have studied them deeply and gotten some information on them from uh, uh, these Acharyas, Baladi Vidyabhu, some translations of, and, and, uh, and Vishwanath translations of the commentaries on these verses. So, uh, my purpose in presenting this class is to encourage everyone to enter into deeper study of the Bhagavad Gita because uh, it, it is sometimes a tendency to think that the Bhagavad Gita is simply a beginner's book a sort of primer in Krishna consciousness and uh, beyond Bhagavad Gita there are higher literatures which when we delve into them, then we may leave the Gita behind. <clears throat> but actually, all throughout Srila Prabhupada's books, uh, you'll find he's quoting the Bhagavad Gita to substantiate the, uh, uh, even the higher most point, highest most points of philosophy in Srimad Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita. So actually, in the Bhagavad Gita, you can find the essence of all Krishna conscious philosophy as we will if we, if we can get that far we will see how Srila Prabhupada explains some verses are that are listed here indicating the Madhura Rasa so uh, there is no no point when we will leave the teachings of the Gita behind I'm mentioning this because I can remember Many years ago, there was a, a group that started in Los Angeles that has been commonly known as the Gopi Bhava Club. And they were focusing their attention on 
certain sections of Chaitanya Charitamrita and claiming that it's these uh, chapters, these certain verses, which actually are giving the purport of real Krishna consciousness. And there was even someone from that time who said, whenever I read the Bhagavad Gita, I fall into Maya. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> that was on my mind when I designed this course, that the Bhagavad Gita is certainly not meant for that. It's actually meant for delivering us from Maya and fixing us in Krishna consciousness. So, I, but I think all of you will agree with that. So, I um, think we can start with reading the verse that we will discuss this evening. That's from this Tri Shloki Gita. <laughs> Tri Shloki Gita are three verses from the 15th chapter. 16, 17, and 18, which our acharyas say uh, are presenting the essence of Vedanta. Now, the whole Bhagavad Gita is actually the essence of Vedanta philosophy. In the introduction of the Bhagavad Gita, you'll find Srila Prabhupada uh, is quoting Shankaracharya, who says that in, pre, uh, in his presentation of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna has milked the herd of the cows of the Upanishads. So the, that milk or essence is the Gita. And out of the 700 verses of the Gita, these three from the 15th chapter 16, 17 and 18 are considered to contain the essence of Vedanta philosophy. So this evening we're going to read from chapter 15, text 16. Dva vimao purusho loke, kshadash, chakshara evacha, kshara sarvani bhutani, kutasto chara uchyate. Which means, there are two classes of beings, the fallible and the infallible. In the material world, every living entity is fallible. And in the spiritual world, every living entity is called infallible. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Amen. As already explained, the Lord in His incarnation as Vyasadeva compiled the Vedanta Sutra. Here the Lord is giving in summary the contents of the Vedanta Sutra. He says that the living entities who are innumerable can be divided into two classes the fallible and the infallible. The living entities are eternally separated parts and parcels of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When they are in contact with the material world, they are called Jiva Bhuta. And the Sanskrit words given here, Kshara Sarvani Bhutani, mean that they are fallible. Those who are in oneness with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, however, are called infallible. Oneness does not mean they have no individuality, but that there is no disunity. They are all agreeable to the purpose of the creation. Of course, in the spiritual world, there is no such thing as creation, but since the Supreme Personality of God, it is stated in the Vedanta Sutra, is the source of all emanations, that conception is explained. According to the statement of the Supreme Personality of God, Lord Krishna, there are two classes of living entities. The Vedas give evidence of this, so there is no doubt about it. The living entities who are struggling in this world with the mind and five senses have their material bodies which are changing. As long as the living entity is conditioned, his body changes due to contact with matter. Matter is changing, so the living entity appears to be changing. But in the spiritual world, the body is not made of matter. Therefore, there is no change. In the material world, the living entity undergoes six changes, birth, growth, duration, reproduction, then dwindling and vanishing. These are the changes of the material body. But in the spiritual world, the body does not change. There is no old age. There is no birth. There is no death. There all exists in oneness. Chara Sarvani Bhutani. Any living entity who has come in contact with matter beginning from the first created being, Brahma, down to a small ant, is changing its body. And therefore, they are all fallible. In the spiritual world, however, they are always liberated in oneness. So... Now we will 
pick up a few points. I want to go through that purport. Srila Prabhupada in his purport, he very expertly combines the points made by the great Gaudiya Vaishnava commentators on the Bhagavad Gita, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and Srila Baladevi Dibhusan, and then Srila Prabhupada presents his own transcendental insight as well. So, the essence of Vedanta. Now the verse previous to this verse, Bhagavad Gita 15.15. Can someone tell me what is the particular significance of that verse uh, in terms of Vedanta? Mm-hmm. <coughs> yes. And the source of the yes. So, there Krishna says the Vedas emanate from Him. And He is the compiler. He is in, in His incarnation as Srila Vyasadeva. He has presented the Vedanta, which actually means the conclusion, the essence of the Vedas. So, here in this uh, Tri Shloki, in three verses, the entire message of the Vedanta, or the conclusion, the purpose of the Vedas is being given. Now, Srila Prabhupada defines Vedanta, any book that deals with conclusive Vedic knowledge, that is called Vedanta. And in, uh, this is from Teachings of Lord Chaitanya, chapter 19. Also, I might mention in Srila Prabhupada's book, Light of the Bhagavata, he, uh, he also presents these three verses with this introduction. The Supreme Spiritual Master, Lord Sri Krishna, teaches us the import of the Vedas in the following <coughs> verse of Bhagavad Gita 15.16, then that verse is quoted with translation, and then Srila Prabhupada goes on to quote the next two verses. So it's very clear that these Three verses are presenting the import of all the Vedas. Now, from teachings of Lord Chaitanya and Chaitanya Charitamrita, we learn that Vedanta means this, these three terms, Sambandha, Abhideya, Prayojana. Now, can someone tell me what these terms mean? What does Sambandha mean? Yes, Prabhu? Possession of the living entity. Yes, Sambandha literally means connection. <clears throat> there are even some words in European languages, like uh, Swedish and so on, where the same word appears. <coughs> Sambandha means connection. Then Abhideya means? Yes? The process. The process. Yes. Or the functional relationship, when the relationship becomes functional. And then finally, prayojana. This is an interesting word, yes? The goal. The goal. Literally, prayojana means necessity. The necessity of all living entities. And that is also the goal of Vedanta. So, keep this in mind. Now, what's being presented in this verse, the 16th verse of the uh, 15th chapter. You see, there's three verses. So, each one of them is dealing with an aspect of Purusha, Purusha Tattva. So, in this verse, according to the Acharyas, it is the uh, Brahman, Brahman, this aspect of Purusha, the emanation from, from the Supreme Personality of God in the form of the living entities who appear uh, as effulgent spiritual sparks. So, according to the Bhagavad Gita, Brahman is perceived in two features. I've given some reference verses. And, and this is a further, you can say, a further elucidation on the meaning of the terms kshara and akshara, or fallible and infallible. 
So we can quickly look at those verses. 8.3 I didn't have them marked, unfortunately. Yes, here it is. Bhagavad Gita chapter 8, verse 3. Note the first word of this verse. Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Aksharam. Aksharam, which means infallible. Akshama, uh, uh, aksharam Brahma Paramam. Svabhavo Dhyatma Nuchite. The Supreme Personality of God had said, the indestructible, transcendental living entity is called Brahman. And his eternal nature is called Adhyatma, the self. Then it's significant that in the next line of this verse, action pertaining to the development of the material bodies of the living entities is called karma or fruitive activities. So this term akshara is actually referring to the essence of all living entities. All living entities are in their essence transcendental. That is the nature of their very self, Brahman. Uh, but here we're confronted with Brahman in two features. There is the infallible, those who are liberated in their liberated position. But we find Krishna is telling us that some of these living entities have become uh, kshara, they have become fallen. So how did that happen? So, elsewhere in Bhagavad Gita, 15.7. This is a famous verse. Mamayvang sa jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana manakshashtani indrayani prakritishtani karshati The living entities in this conditioned world are my eternal fragmental parts. Due to conditioned life, they are struggling very hard with the six senses which include the mind. So here Krishna very nicely, succinctly explains what is the fallen condition? Uh, what is this conditioned life? It's the condition of the living entity struggling with material senses. In this way, prakriti shtani, he's become situated in the material nature. So, and then there's another reference, 14.3. Here you find clearly the word Brahman is used in a completely other sense than the, the spiritual world of liberated souls. Mami onir mahad brahma tasmin garbam dadam yaham The total material substance called Brahman is a source of birth and it is that Brahman that I impregnate making it possible the births of all living beings. O son of Bharata. So this is interesting. The cosmos, the material existence, may also be called Brahman. Now I've used this word cosmos deliberately because now the word cosmos, it is, we come to think of it as meaning the, the universe. But actually, cosmos in its original Greek sense, means the imposition of order on chaos. Uh, so, this, when uh, uh, material existence is Krishna's imposition of order upon living entities who do not make the grade. Now, what is that grade? That has been nicely explained in the last reference. Mam chayo vibhacharina bhakti yogena sevati sagunan samatit chaitan brahma boyaya kalpate One who engages in full devotional service, unfailing in all circumstances, at once transcends the modes of material nature and thus comes to the level of Brahman. So the transcendentally situated living entities are those who are engaged in full devotional service unfailing devotional service, infallible devotional service to the Lord. Bhakti Yogena Sevate. Sagunan Samatityaitan. They rise above the modes of material nature and thus are situated in Brahma Bhutta platform. So this cosmos or this imposition of order, Krishna is casting living entities and 
to this material existence, to impose order upon them. Why, why is he imposing order upon them? Because they are refusing to serve him, quite obviously. We can understand from these verses in Bhagavad Gita. Therefore they have fallen down. Because Krishna says it is by the process of devotional service that one attains the Brahma Bhuta platform. So, I, I'm just, I'm saying all these things just to show you the deep import of these words, Kshara, fallible, and Akshara, infallible, in the context of the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, it has been explained by Balade Vidyabhusan and, and, uh, and uh, Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur that there's Mayavadi interpretation of, of these words. They take Kshara, Akshara to be the uh, one, the one being who is all of us, who is simultaneously liberated and conditioned at the same time. <laughs> you know, Mayavadi philosophy. But it doesn't fly. This type of interpretation clearly does not fly uh, in the context of the Bhagavad Gita, which is the essence of all Vedanta. Uh, and uh, a proof they have given is also the verse... Vita Ragavaya Kroda Man Mayamu Pashrita Bahavo Gyana Tapasa Puta Mad Bhava Magata. This verse says that uh, many, many, Bahavo means many, many, many persons in the past. Krishna is not saying Eka, one. He's saying many, many persons in the past have become purified through Jnana, knowledge, and Tapasya, austerity. Puta Mad Bhava Magata. And thus they have attained my nature. They have moved from this conditioned state to the transcendental state. So, all of this is all of this import is being expressed here. Now let's look at Shiva Prabhupada's purport a little more closely. The living entities are eternally separated parts and parcels of the supreme personality of Godhead. When they are in contact with the material world. They are called Jiva Bhuta. And the Sanskrit words given here, Kshara Sarvani Bhutani, means that they are fallible. So, let's look at this word fallible. So, which verse are you looking at? Hmm? Which verse are you looking at? 15, 16. Same word. We're just going through the purport, selecting uh, certain points that we want to focus in on because we, we have limited time. So fallible, one meaning of the word fallible means defective. Defective. Now you remember, Krishna says that the fallen souls are his parts and parcels, but what are they doing in this material world? They're struggling with the mind and the senses. So by that struggle, they become defective, fallible, defective, uh, as we know, there are four defects of the living entity. I hope you know. <laughs> what are these defects? Can someone, maybe one Mataji, can tell us what the defects are? Yes? Imperfect senses. Yes. Because they have accepted these material senses, and these senses are imperfect. Therefore, the living entity becomes fallible or defective. And? Hmm? Tendency for cheating. All right, we can put that aside. That's right, but let's put it at the end. So when one has imperfect senses, what naturally follows? Mm -hmm. He makes mistakes. He makes mistakes. Yes, that, that is another meaning of fallibility. And by making mistakes, then where does that lead him? Illusion. Into illusion. And then... If nonetheless, being puffed up by his material mind and senses, he wants to present himself as being perfect, as all, do all the uh, conditioned souls in this material world. They do not like to admit that they are fallible. So what is that called? She has mentioned it. Cheating. Yes. So one thing follows the other. So now, um, how does one get out of such a defective state. So I put up here, we can rectify our defects through inquiry 
one could say into the infallible, but also inquiry of the infallible, meaning inquiring from the infallible. So, here's a quote from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4, Chapter 26, Text 7, Purport. The Vedic instructions are different. Different means different from whatever you may hear from an ordinary conditioned soul with those defects. The Vedic instructions are different because they do not have these four defects. Vedic instructions are not subject to mistakes. The knowledge of the Veda is knowledge received directly from God and there is consequently no question of illusion, cheating, mistakes or imperfect senses. All Vedic knowledge is perfect because it is received directly from God by the parampara, disciplic succession. Now this is all very interesting, at least I find it all very interesting. <laughs> that the living entities who have rebelled against Krishna have been placed in this fallible condition, fallen condition, in which they're struggling with their minds and their senses. Uh, and they're having to undergo birth, death, old age, disease. That's the meaning of kshara. It's been explained that uh, they're subject to change. The bodies are changing. Um, Balade Vidyabhusan says the word fallible also has the sense that their bodies fall down at the time of death. Their bodies drop. <laughs> Anyone who has a body that drops at the time of death uh, can be called fallible. So, so one in this fallible condition, he's suffering. Now, when one is suffering, if he has some intelligence, then he will be inquisitive as to the cause, as to why he's suffering and what is the cause. You may know when Sanatan Goswami uh, took shelter at the lotus feet of Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he asked certain famous questions. The first one is Kayami. Who am I? Who am I? Am I this fallible self, huh? this body, or am I something else? And then he wanted to know, why do I suffer? And he also wanted to know, how can I end this suffering? Uh, and then finally, what is my real duty? These four questions are also, this is the subject matter of Vedanta. You see? So, you can, this is all tied together in a very most wonderful way by Lord Krishna. He's giving the essence of, giving us the essence of Vedanta, which is, there are many hand signals here at the door. These hand signals should be properly addressed by the persons <laughs> whom these hand signals are meant for, <laughs> so that the hand signals will cease. <laughs> More hand signals. <laughs> um, you know, this is a little distracting. Hare Krishna. All right. So, it, it's all wonderfully tied together. The Sri Krishna is presenting Vedanta uh, to the Kshara Purusha, those who are suffering. It is this process of inquiry into the infallible, Brahma Mimamsa. In, uh, in the uh, Vedic culture of education, Vedic culture of knowledge, there are two levels of Mimamsa. Mimamsa means inquiry. So one uh, is called Purva, the lower inquiry. That means the inquiry into the maintenance of this material body according to directions given in the Vedas. Uh, also it can refer to the promotion of the soul to somewhere within this material world by following Vedic injunctions like going to heaven and uh, good birth and power and so on. Krishna mentions this all this in the second chapter. Uh, so those who follow this purva, this earlier study or elementary study of the Vedas, Krishna calls them uh, Veda Vada Rata. Uh, 
they more or less blind followers of the Vedas. They are not deeply inquiring into the subject matter. So, and these persons are certainly categorized as kshara, as fallible. They remain within the cycle of birth and death. But those who actually perceive that I'm suffering, uh, I'm suffering, then they may inquire deeper into the transcendental purport behind the Vedic mantra, uh, which supply all desires. Uh, even you have material desires. There are Vedic mantras to satisfy them. But behind the Vedic mantras, there are the philosophical portions of the Vedas, beginning with the Upanishads, which as we said, Krishna has milked into the Bhagavad Gita. So this is giving the, this is called the Brahma, uh, uh, Brahma Mimamsa, the higher inquiry. So one who has come to the point of understanding I'm suffering, then he should make this deeper or higher inquiry into the real meaning of the Vedas, which Krishna is presenting here. So then, you know in the Bhagavad Gita, there is very much information given by Lord Krishna on uh, the condition of the living entity in material nature. He's explaining that conditioning, that state of kshada, of being fallen in so many ways. So what I want to do is just go over some of the very basic main points that one finds in Krishna's explanation in Bhagavad Gita. One of them, one very major point in understanding what it means to be conditioned is this, that the fallible living entity is ignorant of his own transcendental nature and, of course, his relationship to Krishna due to his bewilderment by the three modes of material nature. Now, you know, the three modes of material nature, they occupy a great uh, many verses. That subject is the subject of many, many verses in Bhagavad Gita. In fact, there's a whole chapter called the three modes of material nature. And uh, many other chapters, there are verses that are describing how these three modes influence the living entity. So, to sum up, in Bhagavad Gita 7.13, Sri Krishna says, deluded by the three modes, goodness, passion, and ignorance, the whole world does not know me, who am above the modes and inexhaustible. Uh, Krishna there is indicating his own position. He is the supreme akshara, the supreme infallible. Uh, so, now because the living entities are under these three modes, mm, Therefore, everything they do in these three modes is fallible. And so from out of their activities in the three modes, there are <coughs> fallible varieties of karma, jnana, and bhakti, which are explained by Krishna in Bhagavad Gita. These constitute the activities of the living entities, the activities of the conditioned human beings in this world. For instance, fallible karma. Here's a famous verse, Bhagavad Gita 3.27. The spirit soul, bewildered by the influence of false ego, thinks himself the doer of activities that are in actuality carried out by the modes of material nature. Uh, so he's acting, he's, actually it's the modes of nature that are acting. But due to his bewilderment under the modes, he's identifying with that activity. He's thinking, I am the doer. This is what we call a karmi. This is what we mean by fallible karma. Uh, karma, which or activity, which leads to the further entanglement of the living entity, because he's identifying with this material, the the actions of the material modes. This body, this material body we have, is simply a puppet. You may have seen in the Back to Godhead magazine. There was an uh, uh, old one. There was a nice uh, painting. It showed a boss uh, giving orders to some. Shudra type person who's digging a hole in the ground and you see above them there there are strings going from their bodies and above them there the uh, Triguna Mahi the personified three modes of the Daivi uh, Daivi Maya Krishna's material energy and they're pulling the strings causing all this action to happen so the spirit soul actually has nothing to do with this activity he's just identifying uh, due to being bewildered by these modes I often give the example of a person who goes into a cinema 
cinema house and watches a movie. His real position is just sitting in the seat, observing. But because he becomes bewildered by the... Because what is he seeing up there? He's seeing colors, isn't it? Colors projected on a screen. So there are three primary colors. Uh, yellow, red, blue, which actually are symbolizing the three modes of material nature. So there's an interplay of colors. Just like in this world, there's an interplay of three modes. The living entity is, becomes absorbed in this interplay. And then he starts to identify with what he sees on the screen. And there's some actor, Arnold Schwarzenegger up there. And, uh, you know, someone else playing the lead female role. And you notice that in the audience, the, the, uh, the audience, they're identifying with those actors. They actually forget their own identity, that I'm Joe Blow. You know, they start thinking, I'm Arnold, you know, and I'm fighting these bad guys, beating them up. <laughs> and why is that? Because he's in darkness, first of all. That illusion happens because he's, the lights are turned down. So darkness, ignorance. In this ignorant state, he becomes bewildered by the interplay of the three modes and identifies with this body. So that's fallible karma. Uh, then fallible jnana. Sri Krishna gives many examples of that. Here's one from Bhagavad Gita 7.24. Unintelligent men who do not know me perfectly think that I, the Supreme Personality of God, it, Krishna, was impersonal before and have now assumed this personality. Due to their small knowledge, they do not know my higher nature, which is imperishable and supreme. So what type of philosophy is Krishna describing here? Mayavadi philosophy. So the Mayavadis in this world, in this world of conditioned souls, someone who comes out and speaks this Mayavadi philosophy is considered by the other fallible souls to be very wise. There's, you know, in the esoteric bookshops even today, there's shelves and shelves of this same Mayavadi philosophy. Or why speak of esoteric bookshop? Just speak of the established institutions of learning, university. Uh, the books that are being taught there, they're all Mayavadi philosophy. This is far as the living entity's knowledge can go when he's conditioned in the material existence. We're going to be speaking a little more detail, uh, in a detailed way about that later on, about uh, the types of knowledge. But this is far as a living entity can go when he's conditioned by mind and senses. Uh, to ne negation, irvishesha. And then finally, fallible bhakti, Bhagavad Gita 7.20. Those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires surrender unto demigods and follow the particular rules and regulations of worship according to their own natures. Prakritim niyatasvaya, Krishna says in this verse. They are worshipping. It is looking like religion. Uh, it appears to be religion. And uh, we may think of them in our conditioned state. Oh, they're very pious, very pious persons going to church every Sunday or whatever they're doing, saying their prayers. But, he, but if the object of their prayers is material sense gratification or even salvation, uh, elevationism or salvationism, these are just two forms of materialism. So Krishna says, prakriti niyatasvaya. They're, they're following their own conditioned natures in this religion. That's all that's going on. Uh, this is another, in other words, another puppet show. <laughs> Just another form of the same old puppet show. They're following their own conditioned natures. Yes? Maharaj, how is it to understand that uh, this kind of doing as if religious is called bhakti? Yeah, well that's the term Krishna uses in the Bhagavad Gita. In his next verse, we can find it. I'll just... 7.21 Krishna actually specifically uses the verse Yo yo yam yam tanu bhakta shradhyarchitam ichati tasya tasya chalam shradham tam eva vididam yaham I am situated in everyone's heart as the super soul as soon as one desires to worship some demigod I make his faith steady so that he can devote himself to that particular deity. So Krishna uses the term bhakti here. Because actually, actually the tendency to worship, where does it originate from? It originates, Krishna indicates, from that eternal relationship in the heart. 
between soul and super soul. Prabhupada once explained that the soul, the soul actually, the desire really is to worship the Lord who is there with him eternally. And uh, Krishna, as Paramatma, is inviting to us to do that. He's with us in the heart. And his message to us is, love me, love God. I'm paraphrasing what Prabhupada said. But just like uh, uh, in a transmission, radio transmission or television transmission, if there's interference, some disturbance comes in between, then the message becomes garbled. So in the same way, within the heart, the message, because of our material desires, Krishna mentions that, those whose intelligence is stolen by material desires, then the message becomes garbled. Instead of love God, it becomes love dog, the exact reverse. Instead of G-O-D, it's D-O-G. <laughs> so, you know, like, like the karmis, you know, that karmi householders, they keep at home a little fuzzy dog, you see, instead of a deity. And they pet the dog, and they wash the dog, bathe the dog, sometimes they dress the dog, they feed the dog, <laughs> they put the dog to rest, they wake the dog up. <laughs> they do all the 64 items of bhakti to the dog. <laughs> Now Krishna is speaking here of demigods, but <laughs> we have fallen so far <laughs> that now it is dog. <laughs> so, going onward. Yes, so this is the condition, this is what we mean by conditioning of the living entity. He's under the three modes, so he's acting. Uh, he, he's acting and he's trying to develop knowledge and he's even trying to worship, but it's all fallible. It's all you can use the word condemned. It's all useless. Huh? That's the meaning of condition. No matter what he does, he remains in the same conditioned state. Now, but Krishna has done something to help the conditioned soul. Uh, this is very significant. Bhagavad Gita 4.13 According to the three modes of nature. Hmm? Because those three modes come from Krishna. So it's not that only these three modes are just meant to keep the living entity in, in illusion. They have that aspect. But as Prabhupada mentions in a purport, <coughs> maya has a twofold meaning, illusion and mercy. So, according to the three modes of material nature and the work associated with them, the four divisions of human society are created by me. And now this is very important, the next line, which I will explain a little later. And although I am the creator of this system, you should know that I am yet the non-doer being unchangeable unchangeable. You've heard this word a little earlier in this class. That is, again, aksharam. Uh, of course, in this verse it is avyayam, but it means the same. That's Krishna's position. He's above. He's transcendental. Now, why did Krishna manifest the Varnashram Dharma system within this world? That is, uh, to separate or to show uh, who, which among these living entities are pious and impious. It is giving a chance. It is a means to give a chance to the living entities to become pious or to become impious according to how they, they operate within the Varnashram system. Like Prabhupada says, Varnashram, actually these four divisions are everywhere, even in the Mlecha Yavana culture. But in Mlecha Yavana or Damania culture, the four divisions have a completely different purpose than they do in the culture of the pious souls. So what is the difference? We, we were mentioning pious and impious fallible beings. Both are fallible. Pious and impious. Both are fallible. So, uh, impious. Those miscreants who are grossly foolish, who are lowest among mankind, whose knowledge is stolen by illusion, and are partake of the atheistic nature of demons, do not surrender unto me. Hmm? So, there are four classes of human beings in Varnashram. Brahmana, Chetriya, Vaishya, Shudra. And here is mentioned four classes of impious uh, living entities. And these generally correspond with Brahmana, Chetriya, Vaishya, Shudra. This is not a, not a hard and fast rule, but generally if you study these four classes, you'll find generally they correspond with these categories. Uh, so, those who have a Brahminical nature or Chetriya nature, Vaishya nature, Shudra nature, who do not surrender to Krishna, then they will become known as 
What? Mudha, Naradama, Maya Pritigyana, or Asura. They can be called by these terms. <coughs> Whereas on the other side, O best among the Bharatas, four kinds of pious men begin to render devotional service unto me, the distressed, the desire of wealth, the inquisitive, and he who is searching for knowledge of the Absolute. So this is the difference. One class has a tendency to surrender and the other class doesn't. Prabhupada, here's a quote from Srila Prabhupada. I believe on that formula. Namam duskritino mudha prapadyante naradama. I believe that verse very strongly. That anyone who has not surrendered to Krishna or is not Krishna conscious, he must be within this list. Duskritina mudha naradama maya pritigyana asurim bhavimashrita. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> so in Bhagavad Gita 7.14, Sri Krishna says that the pious can become infallible. This divine energy of mind consisting of the three modes of material nature is difficult to overcome. But those who have surrendered unto me can easily cross beyond it. See, the pious, those who are pious, they have that tendency to surrender. They approach Krishna, even if it is with material desires. But they approach Krishna. Huh? So if they begin to render service, and they advance and finally come to the point of surrendering to Krishna, then what happens? By surrendering to Krishna, they cross over the hurdle of the material world. They cross over the three modes of material nature. And they attain that state called akshara, the infallible state. So this is accomplished in terms of Varnashram Dharma. This is one of the big, big uh, messages, major messages of the Bhagavad Gita. Selfless service. So this, this is what Krishna is telling Arjuna. You act as a chatriya, but not for yourself. Why did Arjuna want to stop the war? Krishna pointed out, because of selfishness. You're a Chetriya Arjuna, but because you are uh, uh, making plans for enjoying the fruits of your activities, and you see in this fight, there's nothing for you to enjoy, therefore you want to quit. So therefore your duty, you've fallen down from your duty. Isn't that the point? Fallen down. Again, Kshara. You've fallen down from your duty. How... Uh, how have these impurities come upon you? Krishna asks. How have you fallen down like this? Huh? So, this is major message of the Bhagavad Gita. That in terms of Varnashram Dharma, one should do one's duty without any personal motivation. Now what does that obviously mean? So what, then what do you do your duty for? For, uh, you know, for Mary, Mary, <laughs> Mary Sue or for, you know... <laughs> for what? For the... Akash, for the shunya, for the void. No, you do it for Krishna. That's what it means. Uh, there's a nice story in this connection from the Gautamiya Tantra uh, uh, that just illustrates how uh, what selflessness means, what selflessness really means, and how it liberates one from all conditioning, how one can cross over all obstacles. And that was that the gopis were waiting for Sri Krishna in the forest at night and Krishna was late. So when Sri Krishna arrived, the gopis asked, Our dear Lord, why are you late? And Krishna said, Because I had met on my way here the great sage Durvasa Muni. And so he is, I, I accept him as my guru. He's such a great sage. So I stayed with him. I uh, offered puja to him. I received instructions from him. Uh, so therefore I'm late. So the gopis, they were amazed. They said, well, Krishna, you're the Supreme Lord. You have a guru. <laughs> if there's someone that you respect, then he is certainly respectable to us. So how can we see him? And then Krishna pointed out the way. You can go this side. So the gopis were very eager to serve the sage. So they uh, gathered together all sorts of pots of, of uh, foodstuffs, more than 50, something like 52 or 52, uh, four big clay pots of food stuff. And they wanted to take this, these pots to uh, Durvasa Muni and offer them to him. But the Jamuna was in the way. 
And that time, late at night, there was no boatman. So the gopis asked Krishna, how can we cross the Jamuna? So Krishna smiled and he said, you uh, pray to the Jamuna that if Sri Krishna is a perfect and faultless brahmachari, then give us passage. <laughs> so the gopis did that. They went to the bank of the Jamuna and they offered this prayer and the Jamuna's waters parted and the gopis could cross. Then they met Durvasa Muni and they were, there was a, a kind of a struggle between, a, not a struggle, but a kind of a competition between the gopis to see who would offer their, their preparations to Durvasa first. They were competing. One gopi would come forward and another gopi would step in front. No, take mine. And another would pull her back. Take mine. So, go to, uh, so uh, sorry, Durvasa Muni he held up his hands. It's Shanti, peace, stop this. He said, if you want to feed me, then you make a line and I will open my mouth and you just place the food stuff in my mouth as much as you like. Don't worry. Because each of the gopis were thinking, my pot is so big that he'll only be able to eat this, so let me be first. And then the others, they will not get the benefit. But Durvas said, you all stand, just make a line with your 54 or whatever pots. I'll open my mouth and you put as much as you want in my mouth. So the gopis did that. <laughs> and he ate everything. All the pots were empty. And the gopis were very satisfied and very amazed <laughs> also. <laughs> and then the gopis said, So, Sage Dravas, we want to go back to join Sri Krishna. But the Jamuna is there. So how can we cross at this time of night? And then Dravas said, uh, You pray to the Jamuna that if Dravasa Muni is a perfectly sense-controlled sage who lives up to his name, Durvasa, you see. Durva is a kind of grass which is used in Vedic sacrifice. Asha means he eats. He, a perfectly self-controlled sage who eats only Durva grass. <laughs> then the Jamuna will pa give you passage. <laughs> so the gopis went to the river and they asked this and Jamuna Devi parted her waters and they could cross. So then the gopis came to Krishna and they said, Our dear Lord, we have some questions for you now. <laughs> we think that, uh, yes, we, we have seen the truth in the statement that a disciple is just like the spiritual master. This we have seen. <laughs> that you have said something which is untrue to us. That you are perfect faultless brahmachari. Perfect faultless brahmachari does not meet with young girls in the middle of the night in some forest, in some lonely place. And your spiritual master also, he's claiming to be Durvasa, one who eats only Dharva grass. <laughs> but we, we fed him all of the <laughs> foodstuffs that we brought. So he's just like you. <laughs> but, but the thing we can't understand is why when we made these statements to the Jamuna Devi, she parted her, her, her waters and let us pass. Huh? Because we were asking, if this is true, that Krishna is Brahmacharya and Durvasa eats only grass, then you give us way. And, they, and she parted. And then Krishna smiled. And he said, uh, he explained to them, to the gopis, that uh, my activities with you are not impelled by any desire. Uh, I am the Supreme Personality of God. I am Atmarama. I am self-satisfied. But I am here with you simply because of your pure love for me. Therefore I am here. Because you want me to be here by your pure love. Your love is pure without any tinge of material desire. Therefore I am here. And therefore, this is the point. Therefore there is no registration of these activities in, in the, the karmic record, you see. <laughs> therefore these activities are not under karma. Therefore I can meet with you in the middle of the night. And I'm still not compromised. Of course, Krishna, he's the, he's the supreme Brahman himself. So he's naturally the perfect brahmachari because the word brahmachari brahma achar one whose behavior is spiritual so everything krishna does is always perfect and transcendental and the same is true of my devotee durvasa muni uh, he eats nothing but grass he only opened his mouth that you could put food in it out of because because of your pure love uh, so he did not actually consume this food uh, it simply he accepted an offering of love. There was no. It, it, in other words, it was not a material activity. 
So therefore the Jamuna she parted for you because it's all transcendental. So this is the this is the point. Krishna says, you see, in that verse we mentioned where Krishna says, I have created the Varnashram system. He says, and yet I am the non doer, being infallible. Uh, and then Krishna says that those who surrender unto me, you see, within Varnashram system, there are those who have the tendency to be pious, to approach me, serve me. And if they surrender to me, then they cross over the three modes of material nature. So this is the whole point. The whole point is just to surrender to Krishna. Otherwise, there's no other meaning to piety. Now that's going to be developed later on in, in, in later verses that we're going to study. But I, I couldn't help but mention that here. So, but on the other side, was that, was that clear? <laughs> All this was clear? <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, on the other side, <clears throat> the impious, those who are impious, in other words, what is their qualification? What is the only qualification of an impious person? Someone say, what is the essence of it? We're talking of essences. The pious person does what? The imp huh? And the impious person doesn't do it. Huh? Surrender to Krishna. Those who are discretina, Krishna says they never surrender to him. So what happens to them? Those who are envious and mischievous, who are the lowest among men, I perpetually cast into the ocean of material existence, into various demoniac species of life, attaining repeated birth amongst the species of demoniac life, O son of Kunti, such persons can never approach me. <coughs> Gradually they sink down to the most abominable type of existence. In other words, they're fallen. They're fallen already, but they fall down more and more and more until they come to a point from which they cannot even rise again. They become so fallen. So now moving on. Moving on. <coughs> ah, now we come to this point. How to become pious. Phew. We're already over time. <laughs> I knew this would happen. <clears throat> How to become pious. Oneness does not mean that they have no individuality. This is from the purport. Oneness does not mean that they have no indiv individuality, but that there is no disunity. They are all agreeable to the purpose of creation. So this is the secret of becoming pious. You agree to the purpose of creation. Now, who can tell me from Bhagavad Gita? I'll give a hint, third chapter. What is the purpose of creation? Hmm? Yes? Nothing against you by suffering the more and more in the material world, you realize it and doesn't <laughs> I'm looking for a particular verse from the third chapter. Uh, text 10. Yes? <laughs> I'm showing my watch. <laughs> showing you. This is never going to work, I tell you. This, is not, this class is not going to work. <laughs> no, but not within this time frame. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so what should, should I stop? <laughs> uh, no way, but anyway. I'll, I'll go on for five minutes more, and we'll just continue tomorrow, and wherever we end up, we're going to end up. Right, this is like, you know, what can I say? <laughs> it's the first run class. So, uh, yes, Krishna Chaitra Prabhu, you had the answer. To perform yagya, sacrifice. In the beginning of creation, the Lord of all creatures sent forth generations of men and demigods along with sacrifices for Vishnu and blessed them by saying, Be thou happy with this yagya, sacrifice, because its performance will bestow upon you everything desirable for living happily and achieving liberation. That is the purpose of creation. So here's a simple, another simple way of understanding the difference between pious and impious. Those who perform jagya, they are pious. And those who do not, they are impious. Now, there's also a question of fallible and infallible jagya. Hmm. This is told by Krishna in chapter 2, text 45. Someone know that verse or remember vaguely? Yeah, Chaigunya Vishaya Veda. The Vedas deal mainly with the subject of what? Incredible. We read it again. The three modes of material nature. 
Mm-hmm. O oh, Arjuna, become transcendental to these moods. Be free from all dualities and from all anxieties for gain and safety and be established in the self. That self again means the transcendental position. Now, uh, oh, I, yes. I have a whole explanation here of philosophical explanation of all this, which now is not the time to go into. Maybe we'll take it up tomorrow, or maybe we'll just go on from somewhere else, I don't know. But anyway, you've got the basic idea.